into the web news service irs tax news some tax considerations for people who are separating or divorcing number one make sure you file the tax return first so you can claim all the kids number two make sure you can still deduct the mortgage interest and property taxes number three the irs does not generally allow a divorce deduction even though it was clearly an ordinary and necessary business expense Number four, remember that at least the dog still loves you, even though you'll never be allowed to see it again. That last one, not really being tax related, but I thought I'd throw it in there. Anyways, those are just a couple jokingly ones here. We're going to go to the IRS items down below. IRS tax tip 2022-91, June 15th, 2022. When people go through a legal separation or divorce, the change in their relationship status also affects their tax situation. So obviously, just like with every other kind of life situation, what's the first thing you do before you make a decision? You look at the tax consequences. Should I get married? We do a tax projection and then whatever the results say, that's what we do. Divorce, you know, same kind of thing. Should we move? That's it. That's I'm just joking here. That's probably not the best way to go, but uh, there will be tax considerations typically for these kinds of things. So the IRS considers a couple married for filing purposes until they get a final decree or divorce or separate maintenance. So that uh, kind of timeline in terms of when someone is divorced can get into some gray area. In other words, if you're talking about a separation, then it can be a little bit confusing as uh, well as or to the term as whether someone is legally separated or basically divorced or not. Obviously, if you go through a full divorce, then it's a little bit more clear cut. So if you're in that kind of gray area, you might have to do a little bit more research, possibly even go into states, uh, the state information for that separation uh, calculation or definition. Update withholdings. When someone becomes divorced or separated, they usually need to file a new form W-4 with their employer to claim the proper withholdings. So that means that uh, because you're not married and we have uh, tax consequences due to married filing jointly, having separate uh, progressive tax tables, as well as uh, not having two incomes. So your income is going to ba basically be different uh, as well. So that would mean that you got to file a new W-4, which you could do with the tax withholding estimator to get a new estimate. Remember, as you file a W-4, you go to your employer asking them for the information about how to do it, but they're probably not going to give you tax information because they don't want to get sued. What you got to do is do your own kind of calculation on it, possibly with the use of the tax withholding estimator, which is a good tool here, basically becoming more of like tax software to help you do a tax projection to help you fill out the W-4. So if they receive alimony, they may have to make estimated tax payments. The tax withholding estimator tool on irs.gov can help pe people figure out if they're withholding the correct amount. Understand that, so obviously if there's gonna be alimony uh, involved, one spouse paying the other spouse, you wanna th think about whether or not there be any tax consequences. And there have been changes to the laws with regards to alimony and uh, child support. So those are kind of interesting areas that used to be that basically the child support was something that you didn't get to really deduct if you're the one paying it, but you didn't also have to include it as income if you're the one uh, receiving it. And uh, on the alimony, the alimony was the one where if the person receiving it, they would have had to claim it as income and the person that paid it possibly getting a deduction. They basically changed that law, so it's going through some adjustments, so it kind of depends on when the ag agreement came into play, and it might still be necessary to kind of make that distinction within the divorce arrangements, because you can imagine the law changing again in the future, making this distinction between kind of alimony and child support with regards to tax consequences for them. Also note that if you have a state income tax, they also might make different distinctions. They might be using like the old law, for example, and not the change law. So it's, it's, it's useful to make the divorce, any kind of agreement, of course, that you're making with anyone, you'd like to make it as clear cut as, as possible so everybody knows what's going on. And you gotta take into consideration the taxes when you're doing that as well, because there could be tax implications now and there possibly could be changes to the tax law given the way things are going.
in the future. So understand the tax treatment of alimony and separate maintenance. Amounts paid to a spouse or a former spouse under a divorce decree, a separate maintenance decree, or a written separation agreement may be alimony or separate maintenance payments for federal tax purposes. Certain alimony or separate maintenance payments are deductible by the payer spouse and the recipient spouse must include in income. So that's going to be the question. How are we formatting the payments? Does that formatting mean that there's going to be tax consequences deductible for the one paying income to the one receiving? However, individuals can't deduct alimony or separate maintenance payments made under a divorce or separation agreement executed after 2018 or executed before 2019, but, but, late, but later modified if the modification expressly states the repeal of the deduction for alimony payments applies to the modification. So you got to know what the new law is. I kind of I kind of like that they they remove the tax consequences between the kinds of payments because I would think usually I I'm get to the opinion that if everybody had all the information they would make they would make their agreement uh, whatever is best for the two individuals and whenever you put the tax considerations in you say something's deductible or something you're not really you may not be actually helping the one that's getting the deduction for example because all that's going to do is is increase the amount of alimony you're going to pay because if everybody has all the information then it's going to alter it's going to alter <laughs> the amount of the payments and obviously if something's going to be taxable then it's going to be a, an impact to the to the, the government's going to have the, the tax on it although there's a deduction and income side of things so in any case you can think about it whatever but uh but just take make sure you have the full picture in mind of what's going on tax related when you're making the arrangement alimony and separate maintenance payments received under such an agreement are not included in the income the recipient spouse so determine who will claim a dependent child if filing a separate returns now unfortunately in separations the the child uh, can can have significant financial impacts with regards to taxes and possibly other kind of benefit programs and things like that so that means the child becomes uh, you know uh, some something that would be beneficial to claim and whatnot especially if you just got the one child because that would mean that if one person was able to claim them they can move from filing status of single up to head of household which could have a significant impact plus there's a deduction plus uh and and now they're giving out the, the child tax credit was in, a lot bigger last uh last year so we'll see what they do basically uh in 2022 that you'll remember they gave out the advance payments and stuff like that so in any case it becomes important to to put in the agreement i was joking uh, up front that you're going to just file first and try to claim <laughs> the child because that kind of stuff happens you don't really want to do that you want to have it in the divorce agreement in terms of who's going to be claiming uh the child because there are, there are situations the IRS will not let you both claim the same child and whoever files first then the iris will have it on record and that's going to mess everything up if the other one tries to claim it and have problems with it but you want to have it if there's a joint custody situation then you're going to have to think about well what does that mean for taxes because that could mean that the child could possibly be claimed by either spouse in any given year does that mean you're going to be claiming the child every other year on one return or the other or what would be the way to go and make sure you have that laid out and thought about up front so generally the parent <clears throat> with the custody of their child can claim the child tax credit so usually it's a custody thing first right so if the, if the child's living all the time with one parent you would think it'd be going there but oftentimes you have a joint custody situation so if parents split custody 50 50 and aren't filing a joint return they'll have to decide which parent gets to claim the child so make sure to decide that up front and not make it become a a problem there are tiebreaker rules there's a link to that here if the parents can't agree child support payments aren't deductible by the payer and aren't taxable to the payee uh, report property transfer if needed usually there is no recognized gain or loss on the transfer of property between spouses or between former spouses if the transfer is because of divorce so in other words you know if within when you got married theoretically all the all the property is joint at that point in time right so that would mean that at divorce one person may have walked away from the situation with more property but but then they originally had you know maybe they didn't grow if it grew together then whatever but you know then uh, but if that happens it's 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 a separation of what was once a taxably one entity 
And so you would think there wouldn't be any tax consequences. It wouldn't be like income to the one uh, individual, even if they, even if they, you know, got more than they went in or whatever, because it's not an income. It's, it's basically a one tax person separating and having an allocation due to divorce, not a taxable event. Typically people may have to report the transfer uh, on a gift tax return. So, so if you're gifting something, then, then you got the gift tax that you're going to basically have to deal with, which would kind of, it's kind of tied together with your estate tax. Consider filing status. So divorcing couples are still uh, married as of the end of the year and are treated as married for the year and must determine their filing status. So one more time, divorcing couples are who are still married as of the end of the year are treated as married for the year and must determine their filing status. So then the question is, when did the divorce take place? Are you in the process of separating but haven't separated by the end of the year? Then you gotta deal with your filing status, which you would think if you're still married would be between married filing joint, married filing separate. Married filing separate is often not as advantageous most of the time as married filing joint when you're thinking about a full you know tax return process so uh the what is my filing status tool there's a link to that here it's on irs.gov can help people figure out what status makes sense for their situation so sometimes most of the time the status is pretty straightforward but sometimes you're in like that gray area possibly because you have a dependent or you don't know if you're divorced or not, you're separated but not divorced. What are the regulations for separation and so on. So here are the statuses separating or, rec or recently divorced people uh, should consider. Married filing joint. On a joint return, married people report their combined income and deduct their combined allowable expenses. For many couples, filing jointly results in a lower tax than filing separately. Married filing separately. If spouses file separate tax returns, they each report only their own income, deductions, and credits on their individual return. Each spouse is responsible for only the tax due on their own return. People should consider whether filing separately or jointly is better for them. So again, you might say, well, I'm, I'm no longer, I'm trying to separate here, so I'm gonna try to file married filing separately. You might wanna do that, but if you're still actually technically married, then, then it might, you might not get as much of a tax benefit to do that. You also have some issues with community property states versus non-community property states and the reporting of it and so on. So, so you wanna consider that. Then head of household, some separated people may be eligible to file as head of household if all of the, these apply. Their spouse didn't live in their home for the last six months of the year. So now we're getting into what does it mean to be separate, for example. They paid more than half the cost of keeping up their home for the year. Their, their home was the main home of their dependent child for more than half the year. So if you were clearly divorced, for example, or if you just had a dependent child and you were never married or something like that, then instead of single, the worst filing status for taxation, you might be able to bump up to head of household, which is typical, which is better with the with the tax rates. This the standard deduction is typically better. And of course, you got the kid, which has a deduction for the kid. You get a kid deduction. And so single, once the once the final decree or divorce or separate maintenance is issued, a taxpayer will file a single a single starting for the year it was issued unless they are eligible to file as head of household or they remarry at the end of the year. So if you separate, then you're going to be going to, to single unless you have a dependent, which is the worst filing status for tax purposes. So so remember, if you're if you're married, then you can't really jump down to head of household or single unless you're legally filed as separated in some way, then you're kind of stuck in here to married or married filing separately, unless you can basically be separated or file head of household, you know, in a, in a strange, you know, an, an unusual circumstance, because you're kind of like separated. And then if you're if you're divorced, or you're separated, then the question would be, okay, well, typically, are you going to be head of household or single, and that'll often depend upon whether you have at least one dependent, that uh, that you can claim and that's why that one if you have one child that's kind of caught in the middle of this that child becomes more valuable <laughs> in form of tax uh, standpoint if uh, if the filing status would change from single to head of household for claiming them along with the you know the deductions or credits for the child tax credits and so on any case more information can be found at the publications below we got publication 504 divorce or separated individuals topic number 452 alimony and separate maintenance there's links to that stuff here there'll be a link to this in the description